And then let's go ahead and advance to the next slide with the arrow keys. Okay. So um, hopefully everybody got the handout and we just passed out. I did make, I made 20 copies. So it looks like that's about how many are here tonight. Welcome everybody. This is Fast and Light Backpacking and Climbing. I'm Darren from Sierra Mountaineering Club. And hopefully we're joined by a couple people online. Hi guys, wherever you are. Uh, if you can't hear me either online or um, here, make sure you speak up. And I'd like to submit that just because I'm up front doesn't mean I know everything about this topic. It just means I'm willing to stand up and take your questions about it. <laughs> so um, please, if you have something to submit to our discussion, I'd love to hear it. Okay. Um, first off, uh, we're going to look at this non-scientific chart right here, which shows us the relationship between pack weight and your ability to enjoy the wilderness. See here, 100 pounds, bottomed out. Zero pounds, you're not going to be leaving the house. Somewhere between those two is this, wow, I love it, having a great time. This is around 25 pounds. And then as you get to 50, that's quite diminished. To 75, it becomes more like, uh, okay, beast of burden. So our hope is that um, I can show you some ways, just some suggestions. Come on up, sit anywhere you can, um, to cut your pack down, be more efficient, make some choices about what you carry and how you use it, and help you go farther. Um, you guys, we're passing around a little sign-in sheet. It's on kind of a steel clipboard. So if you could, yeah, go ahead. If you could put your name and email on that, that would be fantastic. There's a couple more handouts here. I have some, you don't have to get them now, but I've got some stickers on the shelf for everyone who came tonight. So come on in, we got a few more chairs. Some over here. Oh, okay, cool. All right, great. Well, okay, so we know that pack weight's important. You got to bring enough to keep yourself safe and to accomplish your tasks. But um, at some point, there's an old saying in climbing, which kind of goes like this. If you bring a bivouac, you will use it, which may, means to say that if you bring all this extra stuff for emergencies, then it'll weigh you down so much that you'll end up having, you'll end up having an emergency. Okay, so, so you don't want to create your own problems. Um, we're looking for three tests for anything we take. So they're right here. First off, they have to accomplish the task that we want them to do. That's a pretty easy test. It's just a matter of picking the right piece of gear for the task. Wade, can you see me on camera here? Yes. Okay. And then this one is really important too, which is multi-use. So can you guys think of something that's multi-use? Anything you would carry? on an outdoor trip? Knife. A knife, okay, that's a good one. That's definitely multi-use. Can camp cut stove. things. Okay, camp stove, yeah. What What can you do more than cook with it? Make coffee. Make water. No, oh, okay, yeah. Purify good, water. okay, yes, you can, you can melt snow. Yeah, come on in, guys, great. The water reservoir, which we use is water storage and, yeah. yeah. Good, these are all great examples. So trekking poles, rope, carabiners, backpack frames. I mean, think just about everything really is multi-use if you expand your thinking, okay? So that's one thing we need to do. It's not just have a gear that's multi-use, but think about different ways in which you can use the gear to do more than it's probably designed to do initially. And then of course, lightweight. So my question to you is, where does that stop? You know, we've got heavyweight, durable, then we've got lighter, and less durable, and at some point, it becomes so light that we our, our margin of safety is going to be too thin. You have any way to, to know when that occurs? Like you have one cheap lighter and it doesn't light. <laughs> yeah. If probably what's gonna happen is you'll have an experience where you relied upon your lightweight gear to accomplish something for you, and it failed. And then you're gonna upgrade to heavier gear. So you kind of have to, some of this is really experimentation and also it depends on what you're using it for. So, okay, so here's our goal. I've got three 30s in a row. What this refers to is the 30-30 plan, okay? So you want to have all of these or at least one of them if you're trying to go light. One of them is you want to try to fit all your gear in a 30 liter pack, okay? So that's this pack right here. This is a Black Diamond Speed 30. 
So this pack, even if you're a climber, a pack of this size should be big enough for up to four days. Not for a week, okay, but up to four days. That would cover your weekend missions and certainly overnight stuff. The other one is that you want to have about 30%, no more than 30% of your body weight on your back. So that's also, that could be pretty high, but please don't ever go over 30%. If you are, then transfer the load to your, your partner who's bigger than you or leave something at home. <laughs> and then 30 pounds. Now for people who, are, who weigh 90 pounds, this is the same number, but we're looking at 30 pounds. That would be better than 30%. If you're, at, I'm, I'm 170, so 30% of my body weight would be a lot more than 30 pounds, but 30 is what we're looking for. 30 pounds, 30 liters, or 30% at the worst. So where can you pull that weight out? Uh, right here, I've got the, the main areas and this little handout I gave you. I'm gonna, can you press me a copy of that? Just real quick. Um, by the way, this is available on our website. And I'm, I'm gonna go through it uh, in detail. What I, uh, it'll show you uh, how I, how we, I, I actually went through a semi-scientific process a few years ago of looking at all the different gear options in preparation for this seminar when we first used to teach it a couple years ago and kind of calculated this all out and noted the difference between the two. One of the big ones is food. So I'm, I'm going to like asking you questions tonight. So why is that a big one? You tell me, like, what can you do about your food that can either hurt you or help you in terms of weight? And getting down the trail. Take too much. Take too much. Okay, yeah, that's right. Or too little. Or too little. Which one do you think people tend to do more? Take too much. Right, exactly. <laughs> they take too much. So, how many of you have come home from a trip of at least a day or two and you have still had food in your pack? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you most of the time come home with food still left in your pack? Raise your hand. Okay, you guys need to take late less, okay? <laughs> Your goal should be to come home hungry, okay? Oh, really? Yeah, come home empty, completely empty and hungry, okay? Now, you could eat your last bar maybe a mile before, the, before you get to the car, but, you know, come home hungry. How long can you last without food in the backcountry or anywhere? If you have water, you can last for, for a couple weeks. Who would want to, right? But even if you don't have water, you could last for a couple days, at least a day, maybe two would really start to get bothersome at that point. You can make it through 20, 40, 48 hours with nothing in your stomach. So it's kind of a barbaric diet plan, but I would try it. I would, I would ask yourself next time you go out, challenge yourself to come home completely empty, okay? And see if, if you were hurt in any way by taking five pounds less. So you can take a lot of weight off your pack by only bringing what you're going to eat. Next is water and fuel. How much does water weigh? Does anybody know? Mm -hmm. About eight pounds. Right? About eight pounds a gallon. That's right. So dang, I don't have a water bottle handy. Do you have one? No. Okay. So. Okay. So you know, a water bottle is about 30 ounces. So this is gonna weigh a quarter of eight, so two pounds, okay? No, I don't I don't know the specs on fuel, but um, I would suspect <laughs> so, yeah. So, so this weighs two pounds. Um, and if you look at the other sorts of fuel that you can take, this weighs about, I don't know, I should've brought my scale, but I'm thinking that this one full is gonna provide more BTUs than, than this one full. So you just have to make sure you bring just enough. If this is going to be enough for, in winter time, this is going to be enough for three to four days of melting snow and dinners. On a backpacking trip, this would be enough for a week, just in this canister here. But it's going to weigh two pounds. So don't take too much, just take just enough. And also, I guess I want to say that um, both of these, when they're empty, you have to carry them out. But this one you can use again, right? So how about rope? Oh, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. So on water, when you're traveling, how much water do you usually carry? Okay, great. So on my sheet, I said you should carry, always carry less than a liter. Wow. Always? Wow. Yes, carry less. I didn't say drink less. 
or but carry less than a liter. So that means that you, when you have a sources available to you, you fill up then, and you cash and plan so you don't have to carry water. Okay. Now, if you're in a situation where you can't do that because your water sources are too far apart, then it's not possible. But your goal is to carry no more than a liter at all times. Now, there's plenty of times when I'm on a climb and that wouldn't be safe because we're going to be without water for 12 hours. So then I have to carry a liter and a half or two. Okay. So some people have to carry a lot more. I have a few partners, some of our event leaders, who would be uh, doing themselves a disservice if they carried any less than four. That's because they're really thirsty people and they sweat a lot. And this one in particular, I'm thinking of, he's six foot three. So he's got a lot of muscle and he, you know, he just needs more water. Um, I don't know if I'm an average case or not, but your, your goal is carry a liter. Okay. So fill up at streams, drink, 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 drink before you leave. Drink when you come home. I'm talking about water guys. Just, okay. Drink water before you leave. Drink water when you come home to, the, to your tent. Okay. And during the day, take just the bare minimum you need to prevent you from getting severely dehydrated. So. It's a, it's a concept. All right, how about rope? Um, where we're at now um, with ropes is pretty exciting. So this is, uh, this is one of, but not the uh, lightest weight single rope out there now. This one was the lightest weight, weight about two years ago. This is a 9.1 millimeter rope. A rope this small would not have been classified as a single rope, even three, five, certainly not 10 years ago, and definitely not further back than that. Um, so ropes are getting more durable and also thinner, so they weigh less. Um, so we can cut poundage down by taking a shorter rope or a thinner rope or no rope. No rope. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, okay. And then climbing gear, you know, this is, all of these numbers are from my sheet here. How can you save four pounds? Well, how much you take makes a difference. Uh, the types of gear you take, like aluminum crampons versus steel or hybrid axes versus a full length axe or you know a backpacking pack versus a climbing pack that'll be in this category so there's a way to cut that down and boots and crampons that's one place you can save a lot of weight there too you just want to take just what you need and no more that's our goal all right come on in there's still some more um sheets here for folks how are we doing we still have audio and video Yeah, looks like we do. Okay, all right, let's go to the next slide here. All right, so we'll start with your sheet here. Let's go to feet first. Um, everything I'm gonna say is gonna be up here, so you can just follow along. Um, now, this is, this is just a comparison of average weights, okay? So if you're bringing a classical mountaineering boot or backpacking boot, I'm talking this is a little bit old school, but you know, full grain leather, welted system, fibrum sole, lightweight. I'm sorry, not not lightweight, but waterproof, and uh, it's going to run you about this. Lightweight synthetic boots like this one right here are going to cut some weight out of your system, and this is one of the most important places to do that because every time you expand the energy to lift your foot off the ground and put it back down, that's moving mass over and over again so there's a little saying you've probably heard that one pound off your feet is like five pounds off your back that's that's the sentiment so if you really want to lighten up something start with your feet that's a great place to go can you backpack with something like this yeah what about the old twisty ankle thing that people are worried about how do you combat that strengthen your ankle Okay, or you're going to have a lighter weight pack, right? Yes. So it's not you're not going to be forced into that situation where your ankles are going to disastrously twist. So a lot of people are hiking with, uh, say, hookah, right? Yeah, hookahs. Uh, hookahs, uh, with lots of padding in the heel, or trail runners slash approach shoes like these they sell here at Bobcats. Um, I, I'm I don't consider myself a backpacker per se, but I hiked. With these shoes, which are just Reebok trail runners, I hiked uh, 56 miles in five days with a 30 pound pack um, just this summer and it was just fine. I didn't miss my hiking boots at all. <laughs> they, my feet felt great 
One of the keys, though, is that I had an insole. Okay, so I had a nice insole. You talked about ankle support. Uh huh. A lot of people don't know the uh, proper ankle lock for the, how to tie the proper ankle lock. Oh, yeah. Um, so you do the loop inward. Yeah. Right. You tube it. There's, okay. There's a lot of people don't know so the way you put your laces through will lock it down your ankle better? Yeah, you loop it through. Yeah. And then you create a loop and then you cross it in. Cool. And All it right. locks in your ankle best. Cool. So we'll start with this. So consider can you do this? Okay. Next, how many socks do you need to bring? Do you use liners? Um, maybe you could get away with just single socks that you that you uh, dry out every night. And of course, there's a factor. But um, if you bring a single outer sock and a number of liners that you trade out on the inside, that's a good system that I've used. So consider that as an option. Uh, gators. Uh, Gregor, can you grab a gator off the wall there? Any of them? So um, traditionally, gators can be used for anything, you know, snow and, and ice. And then sometimes in like, you know, traditional outward bound programs, they have their students wear these as kind of like keeping talus and scree out of their socks. Over the years, though, the gators have gotten smaller and lighter weight, especially when they go to be fit on shoes like these. So the, they now sell trail running gators, which are essentially neoprene uh, wrap around enclosures with little Velcro on the front. And I've used those with my mountaineering boots all seasons of the year, except for the dead of winter. So I only use these for real snow, cold stuff. And then the rest of the year, I'm using trail running gators. So that saves you a couple ounces there. You guys starting to get the drift of what I'm saying? Okay. So if you have any other suggestions, that's great. Go ahead and go to the next one. Okay, so we're gonna go through clothing just a little bit. Um, uh, this is somewhat of a gear talk, so even though we're focusing on lightweight, I'm just gonna give you some representative examples of what I'm talking about from the store here. So this is what you'd consider as a base layer. This is probably the most versatile piece you could ha have for two reasons. It's got a venting front with a, with a neck, a piece of fabric here at the neck, so it's got kind of a zip turtleneck thing, zip neck they call it. And secondly, it's long sleeve, so it can it can keep you warm, and you can push the sleeves up and zip it down, and it can cool you off. And um, if you wish to use this as your only layer, this is a, a good one to do because it's wicking. So we're looking for something lightweight, zip neck, long sleeve. This is the most versatile type you can have. We've got a mid layer jacket, so for that, there's a lot of choices. It could be uh, something like this soft shell here. Um, we want to have a hood. This is really, this fabric on the top of your garments is really worth it because a lot of your heat comes off the back of your neck. So I made a pact with myself that anytime I buy a jacket or even base layers nowadays, if I could get a hood with it, I will buy that. And that will, because it keeps me warm. So get it with the hood if you, if you wish. Um, you really don't need pit zips. Because this sort of fabric is called soft shell. If I have more time, I'll discuss it in more detail. But it's basically a stretch nylon um, fabric that's warm, waterproof, excuse me, water resistant, and windproof. Okay. Two pockets and not too fancy. Um, this is a great mid layer because it's going to breathe well and it's going to shed just a little bit of moisture that you'll experience out there. Mist fog, light rain, even snow, this will be fine. Another option for a mid-layer would be a jacket like this one. Um, this one is a, a very lightweight puffy type jacket, um, but also note that it's got this stretch panel here for breathing and of course a hood. Um, you don't need a lot of bulk in your mid-layer. As an example, Here's a 800 fill down jacket, the type that they're making nowadays. And I'm gonna pass this around to you because I just want you to see how, how light this is. This is, this is ultra light. Um, it's also not durable, but oh. it is ultra light, okay? So look at this. Um, I know on camera you guys probably can't see this too well, but this is a very lightweight jacket. How much warmth is it gonna give you? Well, it's 800 fill, so it's got the biggest R value of any insulating fill that we know of. And even though it's really thin, if you've got a, 
a, a dry base layer underneath this, and possibly on a jacket on top. It's going to really heat you up. So take a look at that one. I'll tell you what, I'll pass them all around. Why not? Here we go. And of course, everything is on the wall. Um, so mid layer, hybrid layer, base layer, shell layer. You need to, yeah. It just, okay. Shell layer, this is one place where you can cut some weight down, especially in the Sierra. You're not going to use this this item very often. You uh, foggy. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's see if it let's see if it gets me back in here. Tickle the tickle the pad for a little bit there. Okay. Well, I'll work on it in a second here. Okay. So a shell layer like this that's waterproof, you're only going to need it in case of a storm or you want to really get out of the wind or it's let's say it's raining. Okay. When you're climbing, if it's raining, it's time to go home anyway. So um, I just I just have a jack like this in the bottom of my pack, and I use it just for a few occasions. But it it's debatable whether it really needs to be waterproof. Okay, at least water resistant is good. But but being lightweight is important. So if it's somewhere around 12 ounces, that's what you're looking for. We still foggy? Yeah, we're still foggy. Okay. Let's turn it on and turn it off. Sorry, guys, hold on for a second here. We got technical difficulties. Focus or some kind of. No, there isn't. Okay, well, then we'll turn it off. Unplug it. Yeah. Here we go. Okay, we'll just edit that part out. <laughs> All right. Oh, I'll take care of that. Okay. Did we finish with the clothing, Wade? Can you run me back to the last slide, just in, just in case? Probably have to get your cursor over there. Click on it, and then. No, you're moving me forward. Go back. Okay, we talked about base layer, mid layer, mid layer, shell layer. We didn't talk about pants. That's the, it's the same thing as your jacket. You want it to be lightweight. Wind, windproof is important. Waterproof is probably important. But you could really get away with even in climbing with just uh, what backpackers would call rain pants. I prefer to have full zips, but they don't need to be full-on Gore-Tex, three-layer, burly climbing pants. Not for around here. Save that stuff for Patagonia. Um, and then insulating parka. Um, let's see here, I didn't grab one of those yet, but it would be something like this, and this would be nice to put out over all of your clothing. This is considered to be kind of a uh, um, kind of an insulating and safety blanket for you. Stand in for your sleeping bag in the case of a bivouac with a hood, cut fairly large, synthetic or down, either one. So. Pass that around. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Darren, do you get worried about uh, down getting wet? Ever? Yes, in the Sierra, it's not so much of an issue, but if you climb or live in the Pacific Northwest, it's not as good of an idea. If you spend a lot of time in, you know, obviously moist, wet environments like that, you probably want to go with more synthetic. Yeah, Question? Uh, the, uh huh. Oh, um, this layer. Um, Wood, 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 wood will be a good alternative? Or? Oh, yes, wood will be a wool would be a good alternative. Oh, okay. Definitely be better, actually. Okay. Less stinky, last longer. Oh, that's Merino true. wool, at least. Right. But it's just going to cost you. it be twice as much. <laughs> okay, so let's go to the next one. Okay, head and hands. So uh, a sun hat, just something lightweight, um, you know, is going to work. It doesn't have to have any form, especially if it fits under a helmet. Um, you could have a balaclava as another option you can bring along. This is a hood covering, um, excuse me, a head covering underneath your hood or your helmet, and it covers the back of your neck. 
and the top of your head where you lose a lot of heat. So I think these are really worth it. When we talk about 10 essentials, I consider this to be extra clothing. Okay. <laughs> um, glacier glasses, goggles, these, depending on if you're in snow, um, you might not need them, so leave them out of the picture. Out of the picture. Um, in terms of gloves, um, I don't. We don't have any here tonight. I don't think. Do you have any gloves that are have nesting capabilities, Gregor? Like a lighter weight inner glove and an outer weight glove? No. no. Okay. Some sometimes you know gloves come all together like that. But what you what you need is some sort of a shell glove that is waterproof and possibly gauntlet length. Okay. And then a liner glove or two that fits inside of that. So liner gloves are thin, short, probably probably windproof. And the idea behind that is that you use your liner gloves until you need to have waterproof coverings. And then if you get them wet, you've got another backup pair, which only weighs another ounce or two. And just like your socks, you can trade those out. You can be drawing one of them out while you're using the while you're using the first or the second. Inner red glove, and then it has one of those on the way up here. Yeah. And we have those on order. Okay. Outdoor Research has some, Gregor says, and he's got them on order. So I bought a pair of Outdoor Research mittens in 1998, and I still have them. <laughs> and so what I have is a fingered, um, wrist length, totally windproof, like wind block, um, soft shell glove set. I have two pairs with, a, with leather palms for climbing. And then on top of that, I have a Gore-Tex glove shell that's gauntlet length that fits over that is layer two. And then for layer three, I have a Gore-Tex mitten that fits over both of those and is yet longer. That's the entire mitten glove uh, system. That's an idea. And that'll save you, I don't know if it'll save you money, but it'll save you weight <laughs> and complexities. You can change those layers out as they wear out over the years, which I have. So instead of bringing expedition mitts. Let's go on to the next. And yeah, question. Go ahead. The warm headwear. So you, do you just bring the balaclava, or do you have? A no, I have a warm hat too. Warm you know, toque, nightcap. Yeah. The balaclava you like because it covers your neck. Is it yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It does a lot of it does a lot of things. There's another product called a buff. Maybe you guys have heard of it. It's basically oh, yeah. a tube of fabric, and you can put that on your neck. It looks like a neck gaiter, but I've seen this demonstrated at REI, and it's quite the fashion show. They can pull them up and fold them back and move them around. And so they become a balaclava or a bandana or a toque or a neck gaiter or all of it. And But you have to learn how to use it. So if you go to BUFF buff, they'll, they'll show you how to use their product. And they're really lightweight and very versatile. So it'll take the place of a hat, a balaclava, a warm hat, not a sun hat because there's no visor, but it's great. And you can pull it off the Yes, it's really stretchy, lightweight yeah. stuff. Yeah. I have one of those at a high altitude. You already cannot breathe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's also a good sun covering because it's also lightweight. So I've known some people who are wearing those. Yeah. So if you don't, if you haven't heard about the buff, go check that out. Okay. So um, I do actually have visuals for all this stuff. So I don't want to get too deep. We're kind of just going through the list right now. So I'm going to try to cut myself back a little bit here. So the backpack, basically what I'm talking about here is instead of bringing a backpacking size pack, you should be definitely below 50 liters, okay? Um, 40 is your target goal if you're just getting started and depending on how long you're gonna be out, but you wanna get down to 30 or even 28 or 20 if you can. People on sites like Backpacking Life, they talk about taking on you know, a trip of multiple days with a 10 pound pack. Now, those people are really extreme. I don't know if I'm gonna cut my margin that, that thin, but it is possible. 10 pounds sounds like crazy, but people are doing that. So if your pack currently weighs 55, I know you can cut 10 or 15 pounds out of it, I promise you. And part of it is the size of pack you have. You will feel, you will fill whatever pack you take, okay? So <laughs> if you take an 80, you're gonna take 80 liters worth of gear. If you only constrict yourself to a 30, you'll be forced to make, forced to make decisions about what you're going to bring. Generally, you'll be happier with a smaller pack, okay? even if you've got stuff strapped to the outside like a gypsy. <laughs> okay. um, sleeping bags is another place I've experimented with personally, um, but this is all personal, you know, 
preferences, I probably am a warm sleeper, but I also sleep with all my layers on, on top of my backpack and my rope with everything I own underneath me, very tight with, you know, uh, my hood gear on and my hel and my, uh, my hood over the top zipped all the way up just like this. And I have a 55 degree bag that I bought at REI for 75 bucks. It has, it's kind of squarish, it's kind of a square mummy and it has a zip out spot for your feet at the bottom so that you can actually wear it around like a big goofy dress and it's got armholes <laughs> but it's 55 degrees and it folds up to this small and it costs less than 100 bucks okay and i've taken that out on trips where we've dipped down to eight degrees uh -huh. i wasn't super comfortable when that was going on but i was in a small mountaineering tent with another guy who had a huge fill down bag so i think his bag took up some of the space and I just kind of suck thermals off him all night. So <laughs> these are different solutions, you know. I wouldn't recommend that, but a 55, 40, 30, if you take and use all the gear that you have, all your clothing, all of your insulation, your backpack itself, anything you can think of underneath you, you can raise your you can raise your R value and therefore use all of the poundage you brought with you and bring a lighter weight sleeping bag. So I, I challenge you to try to go with one that's maybe instead of taking a zero or a 15. You know, try to go with a 30 or a 40. See, see how you do. Now, for a lot of ladies, this isn't really a discussion at all. So, <laughs> what are you talking about? But I'm just saying it. Think about it. Okay, weigh that in the balance. Where does your backpack and rope? Underneath, from my hips down. And the pads I bring are shorties. I only own shorties that cover this area right here. So I put like my my backpacking lid and all my scrunchy stuff, soft stuff underneath my head. And then my sleeping mat fits here, and then my backpack and the rope fit between there and my feet. Empty backpack. And I'm sleeping on everything, either wearing it or sleeping on everything I have. Mm -hmm. So that's how I get into a 30 liter pack. Aren't you cold <laughs> when you first get up in the morning? No, because the excitement of climbing just fires me up. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so but a 50, uh, 50 degree bag which is extreme to me. Yeah. So that's what you're doing. But what everybody else in the group, is it typical to have a 30 degree bag, 40 degree bag? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm just asking you to experiment with it. So my conclusions I've come to because of my personal experience. So I have a particular body type and fat mass and activity level and all that thing. So this might not apply to you, but whatever your situation is, I bet there's a way that you could cut some of your poundage out but you won't know until you try to experiment with things. So try bringing a lighter weight bag if you have it, or take the one that you've got if you don't have different sleeping bags and take that one out on a trip where you, you're a little bit concerned that it might not be warm enough, and then think about how else you can keep yourself warm other than a more robust sleeping bag. Use the gear you've already got with you. What's your bag weigh, Gary? I don't know. It's, it's maybe a pound and a half, something mm -hmm. like that. I got a 19, let's say a, a 15 last year, Marmot 800. It weighs like 19 ounces. Yeah. You know, and that goes great in a, yeah. in a 30 liter pack. Hey, Gregor, can you grab one of those Marmot sleeping bags off the wall? So the one that I have is built for traveling in hostels. It's just a lightweight synthetic, you know, looking for the, the gray ones, the, those tiny gray ones you showed me earlier, right there. Yeah. So it's, I'll have him bring up one of these. Okay, so sleeping pad, I'll talk about, I don't know if you guys have been in the industry for a while, um, you've seen how sleeping pads have gotten smaller and smaller. So this is the bag, I'm, this is a 55, this is what I'm talking about. This is synthetic 55. Yeah, so they have a 40, 30 or something like that. Okay, okay, yeah. All right, so what's that weight, Gregor? Here you go, Inga. So you would suggest yeah. a synthetic rather than a down? No, not really. Depends on how nice. much contact you have with snow and how careful you are with your equipment. Yeah, if you can buy down, the up the downside is the down of a down. The downside of down is that it's expensive. The upside is that it lasts longer. It's lighter weight. It's more compressible and warmer. And synthetics, so it wins on all the other fronts. But when it gets wet, if it gets wet, don't let it get wet. But if it gets wet, now here's the other thing I want to say: no sleeping bag is warm when it's wet. 
none of them will be comfortable. But a synthetic is going to be slightly more bearable and useful than down. So just don't get your bags wet, and then you can always take down. Okay. If it happens, though, just be prepared. It's going to flatten out. Some of the down ones are they're trying to say that the down is slightly better when wet. Or well, they're making hydrophobic down now, and they're yeah, encasing right. them in certain fabrics, but it also makes it less breathable. So there's always going to be a trade-off. Right. So. Uh, torso length inflatable pack or a closed cell foam in your backpack does save you a lot. See, like, see how much of a weight savings that is here. Here's some of the new fangled types they've got now. This is um, Neo Air X Lite. I've been using this type for a year or so. And I really like them. They're less crinkly than their first generation they had. They even, in case you didn't know, they say fast and light right here on the box. Just in case, oh, that's what it's supposed to be. But it really is small. What's the R value? R value is phenomenal. It's 3.2. And they have another one that's R value of 5, which yeah. is off the charts. I'll just go yeah, grab it. Yeah. So that would be this one, which is the size of my super lightweight mattress that I bought five to eight years ago that had a third of this R value. Okay, so they've made significant advances in that too. So. What do you stand for? It's insulating power. Like when you build a house and you have that pink fiber, fun fiberglass stuff, that's all rated by how much warmth it retains. That's where the R value came from. So this R value of five is unprecedented. Can you them by small or There's two types. The yellow one that doesn't have the, the thin layer of down in it, I believe you can do with your mouth, but this one with the down in order to prevent it from getting bacteria and spit in there they they do have you you have to inflate it with this little bag thing which is a little bit annoying Actually, they have, they have pumps and they also you can use the yep. bag you, you can buy an adapter and it up to it you okay just, you just roll up the bag oh so you can roll it okay so there's many different ways they got it on their website okay so you don't want to pair it you have to carry something like that to pump up the silver one so that's thermarest. Okay. So shelter, but there's a lot to talk about here. And I have a whole bunch of visuals set up for this. So I'm not going to do too much. I'm trying. Um, instead of bringing a, a four season double wall expedition tent, which maybe you wouldn't bring anyway, but just letting you know, there are four season single wall tents now. This one right behind you on the floor here, which happens to be a mountain hardware EV2, that is a Himalayan grade 8,000 meter Everest worthy tent. It's a two. It's a two-person single wall tent and it weighs six pounds. Okay, so that is way light for something that bomber. 100 mile an hour winds, lots of snow load, anything the planet can throw at you, that tent has been designed for it. So, <coughs> all right, then stove. Um, I'll talk more about this in, in probably <laughs> um, in the going forward here, but yeah, canister stoves are pretty awesome because you can bring a burner element that looks like this, okay, the pocket rocket. Um, and then you can pair that with a super lightweight woo, titanium kettle, you know, that's just about the right size to boil some water and melt some snow and also serve as your bowl and your cup. <laughs> this is about the right size. Um, and yeah, go ahead. That stuff is so light, it's mind boggling. So I'll pass the pocket rocket around. This is, it is a canister. It's a canister. So, you know, so those of you who have been around me not long enough know that I give lots of presentations and I always kind of frown upon canister stoves because they don't have enough power to melt snow and really make it above 10,000 feet. But you can you can make it work. Just, you know, I, I like the XGK, which is the heaviest, most durable stove they have. So sometimes you can't really go light. You know, you just have to think about your safety. If you have a stove that doesn't function and you can't get water, you are in trouble, you know, if you're in a snowy environment. So. What was the model you were mentioning? Uh, XGK EX. It's the heaviest stove out there, so it doesn't really fit in this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> but when we talk about robust mountaineering, this is this is the one. Is is it worth it? Uh if we're if we really rely on a stove because we're going to be up high in altitude and we have to melt water and can't have a failure, then yeah, then it's worth it. But otherwise, you could take the pocket rocket, you could take the dragonfly, 
or I can tell I'm MSR specific, um, or the Whisper Light. Those have all been proven to work. Uh, they're great stoves. The new one they have is called the Reactor. You want to grab one of those too while we're just going through it. Might as well just finish it up. <laughs> it's basic, yeah, it's basically a jet boil um, from MSR. That's awesome. That works. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the reactor's got some. It's got some good reviews, so that'll work. What about another tent that's not sixty pounds? Oh, there, there's plenty of tents and shelter options. Yeah, that's a whole discussion. Hopefully, we'll have time for that. So this is the MSR's answer to the jet boil. Um, well, the stove, the the club endorses this one. Um, it's got a little better efficiency, I think, and you can hang it in your tent. And, so they're all great. I mean, stoves stoves are amazing tools. What do you do about the wind? Well, that's one of the problems of a canister stove. What do you do about the wind was the question. You can't put a windscreen around it because that's not allowed. Uh -huh. It heats up the canister too much. So if that's an issue, then you should go with a white gas stove. Uh -huh. Or you can do that because the bottle is detached from the burning element. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh. So you can put the stove in the tent with you? Yes. Oh yeah. California doesn't like it. The state of California won't won't like it. But uh, but you can do whatever you want. I mean, you can hang it in the tent. You know, uh, we have a hanging system for a stove just like that, so it can warm up your tent. You don't have to be outside in the storm, and you don't have to pack a vestibule either. This is awesome. So a cook set, aluminum is fine, or titanium, either one of them. Wait. Let's go to the next slide. And to the little spring over the jet board. All right. So I think in the interest of time, I, I'm trying to go fast. I just want this to be an overview of it's turning out to be the entire presentation. So um, basically, yeah. I'm just I'm going to force myself to go down to 30 second sound bites because I know you don't want to hear me talk on my ear. So crampons, you can decide whether you want 12 or 14 or 10 point crampons, whether you want steel or aluminum. So you can save a lot of weight by going with 10-point aluminum crampons, but they're very limited. Ice axes, you can take a long, you can take a long one that's a full weight axe, or you can take one that's aluminum, lightweight, and shorter. So here's the ice axe we're talking about. Here's stainless steel crampons we're talking about. Okay. They're okay. They're they're versatile. Tricking poles, you can bring them in a compact size or just bring one or use a stick. Um, for your harness, there it is. <laughs> no more bulky rock climbing harnesses. This is your new harness for mountaineering. It's just webbing. Um, for the rope, plan on bringing a 30 meter rope or a small diameter rope instead. Webbing and cord, this is something you can't really save much weight on, but. If you can, go with Dyneema rather than nylon, which is lighter weight. Um, in, the, in the meantime, Gregor, can you grab me some, some Dyneema and some nylon slings, just for comparison? And then your helmet. What happened to my, oh, there it is. So I'm a little bit suspicious of how light helmets have gotten. And they are, they are for different uses. But this is one that is almost versatile enough to use everywhere. So it's just got the impact foam, impact crush foam on the inside and hard shell on the outside. And I just want you to feel how light that is. Oh my. So slings, this would be a nylon sling, which is cheap, absorbs water, and is heavier than, you know what I'm going to say, doesn't absorb water, is more expensive and lighter, <laughs> Dyneema. All right, carabiners and snow pickets and ice screws and rock protection. The only thing I'll say about that is that you want to bring just enough to get the job done and know how to use your tools to maximize the vertical that you're climbing. So it, it does come down to a question of bringing two pickets or three pickets or five cams or six cams or uh, you know a 30 meter rope or a 40 meter or a 50 meter rope. That stuff have, we have to talk about. Is every ounce counts when you're when you're hauling that stuff up a vertical slope it counts even more okay so let's move on let's get to the pictures and some of the other stuff let's go to the next slide here okay miscellaneous and personal um, think about maps 
and how you could print your own. So if you brought a map that was two-sided, you could have large scale on one side and small scale on the other side. Headlamp, um, have you ever seen the Petzl uh, E-Light? It's about this big and it has a locking bar on it so it doesn't turn on um, mistakenly and it runs off of a watch battery and it has a tiny little elastic that fits around you, fits around your head. So I don't see many, many nods. So the Petzl E-Light is this big, literally this big. Now it doesn't turn on a lot of lumens, okay, I know that. But it is a headlamp and it's lightweight and it has a super long burn time, like days and days and days, okay? So you can bring one of those, I have used that. I've climbed Mount Rainier with a headlamp of that, of that sort. A snow shovel, I didn't bring mine in tonight, but there are some that don't have handles. You just stick your ice axe in the shaft and then you just bring the blade. And that's a multi-purpose because you can put your stove on top of it as well as shovel snow and dig your car out when you get back to the trailhead and it snowed the whole foot. Um, stuff sacks, I go with still nylon rather than nylon. So that's really lightweight stuff. It's almost see-through. It has kind of a slick feeling to it. It's siliconized nylon, still nylon. Sunscreen, lip balm, don't bring huge tubes, just bring little travel sizes. Um, eating in utensils, really it boils down to this. All you need is a spoon. Okay, I'm done. Okay, so everything else you can manufacture out of what you've got. If you're, drink, if you're eating out of bagged meals, that can be your plate, your, your mug, your bowl, your cup. You can even cook in them, okay? So not on a stove, but you could put hot water in and just like they're meant to do, okay? So if you want to splurge, then you can bring a little mug, okay? A little mug and a folding spoon. And that way you can have some place other than your water bottle for uh, hot cocoa, okay? And it'll fit half of a um, mashed potato packet. So that's my estimate. That's my thought on that. Um, bring compact short folding blades and too many lighters. Everything you bring should be small, small, small. Just enough for what you need. A watch and altimeter. Don't bring separate instruments. Just make sure it's all in one. Bring your phone. Ideally, we had a presentation on this just last two weeks ago about navigation. We talked about how nice it would be if GPS, phone, ELB, watch, camera, barometer, altimeter, all those people got together and just make one device. Thank you, please. You know, we want something like that. And we don't have to bring all these electronics with us. Water purification. First question is, do you need it? Second question is, can you, get, can you do it with just what you've got without bringing pumps or pills or tablets? Can you filter in another way? Um, I actually have bought a Brita filter that costs 15 bucks at Target, and it's a water bottle. It doesn't cost much, you know, and it's my water bottle filter, so it's in line. It's not a purifier, but I rarely use purifiers in the backcountry, and I rarely use filters, and I drink out of streams all over the place, and I have been for 20 years. I've never gotten Giardia. So you take that as you as you wish. But I also spend a lot of time above tree line. So you don't really need one if, you're, if your water sources are pure. Um, first aid kit, this is one you don't really want to cut back too much on, but you could have one for the group rather than eight different individual ones. And then for your cell phone, if you really need it, well, maybe you, gotta, you have to use it for your camera. And maybe you could just bring one for the group if it's just an emergency item. Okay, let's, let's move on, please. Go ahead, Andrew. So purification. So when you do these group outings, you guys yeah. don't purify. You don't purify your water. We usually have somebody who wants to have a purifier along, and they'll be the one who will bring it. Carries it. And then, you know, most people will say, oh, you know, if it's available, I'll use it." That's kind of how it works out. But the club actually doesn't even own a water purifier, and we haven't owned one in the last six years. One of the reasons is everybody else already owns one, and everyone's paranoid about water quality, so they always bring them. And um, so we haven't had an issue. Not that I know of. Do you think that's a function of you guys being out in more remote places? You know, as, as opposed Probably. to packing part of the GMT. Right? Yeah, I think it is. Probably is part of that. But it's also a fact that the water is clean out there, guys. You know, I mean, generally speaking, it's clean. So don't be I wouldn't be overly concerned about that taking up space and weight in your pack. If you really want to do it super lightweight, then I'd recommend you take tablets, which are the super lightest you can get. And then when that water is purified, just put liquid carbohydrates in there and it tastes fantastic. And then you have dinner and water purification at the same time. 
So that's that's the way I'd go. So your rollover was usually ten thousand feet. Yeah. And except at Boy Scout camp. <laughs> this is Mount Whitney. Yeah. yeah. Right. Boy Scout uh, Lake. Boy Scout Lake. Oh, okay, right. Okay. All right. Oh, food. Okay, right. Food. Okay, basically what this boils down to is boiling. Um, so you're gonna boil water, that's it. Okay. You don't want to cook anything, prepare anything. You don't want to bring anything that has liquid already in it, if you can, because that's weight. Okay. So if we're just talking about cutting it down, this is how you do it. Also, question is if the trip's less than three days, do you need to bring a stove? Can you do it all dry? Because this has been done. And if you bring enough variety, it actually frees up some time and a lot of a lot of weight and space. You just think about, okay, what do I want to eat next? You know? Bring never bring more than one of any particular item. That's my that's my goal. So if I have one trail bar or a type of mix or dried fruit or something, I just eat that once during the duration of the trip. And then the next time I go to find something to eat, I don't have to ingest the same thing again. I just ate five hours ago. <laughs> so you can go dry. Um, you can go with super dense, high calorie foods like bacon and goose and butter, anything that has fat and chocolate in it. And uh, protein is good too, but really we're looking at is fats, carbs, high calories, energy food. That's what we want to get us the furthest. Um, I don't see many people taking salads out there. They're really, they're really great for you when you can afford that sort of thing, but they don't provide the energy that you need. So, <laughs> so you want some power, okay? So as far as I know, I think bacon rules in terms of the amount of energy per pound. That's the one. So not all, not all the oil. <laughs> that's probably up there. Peanut butter. Peanut butter is great too, but it's heavy. Oh, it is. Tell you what, though, for the first time this year, I found dehydrated peanut butter. I took it on the trail, and it was great. Oh. Yeah. So you can buy that in the supermarket now. Really? Oh, yeah. Wow. All right. Let's go on to the next. So, sorry. So you guys always do your breakfast dry? Um, no. People who are addicted to coffee can't do it dry. <laughs> um, I just drink water and have a trail bar. Um, but we don't often do hot breakfasts, at least in terms of mountaineering. If you want to do a hot breakfast, you got to wake up another 30 minutes earlier. So. Um, but you better already boiling water for coffee. Yes. Yeah. Sure, you can do that. It's up. To, it's personal, but really the only hot meal that I would advocate you really need, and even then, that's a question whether you really need it, would be the evening meal, right? So that's when you pound it, right? You get everything in one dense package and get some hot drinks, rehydrate, get ready for the next day. But during the day, it should be all dry stuff, minimal preparation, minimal packaging, minimal weight. <laughs> I, don't, I don't take bacon very often, you guys. Some of the stuff I'm saying, I just want to see what you do. Um, that, that, that is really true, but I don't eat bacon very often. Uh, what I would do, though, when I have taken it is get the pre-cooked stuff. You know what I'm talking about? You just you put it is they sell it as you put it in the microwave for like 20 seconds and it's done. So it's not raw. It's just it's pre-cooked and it's already dry. So you could actually eat that cold. cold. Yeah. yeah. That's the best way to go. It's much less greasy too. All right. Any questions so far? Okay, we're doing pretty good. I, I I'm not gonna run you past nine and I'm gonna try to end before we get to that point because that's a lot of info and a lot of me talking. Now I want to just, instead of going through weights, and I just went through your, your chart, and I want to talk about things in general, and I want you to be more interactive if you can about questions. So before we get launching into this part, um, I, I promised myself that I would I'd mention one comment about fast and light as a concept. It's better than slow and heavy. We know that, <laughs> right? Okay, but we all start off there. Fast is only possible if you're fit. Otherwise, it's just light, okay? It's just light and slow, okay? So don't forget about your personal fitness as part of this idea. Um, the person who is fit is going to move quickly and efficiently through the mountains no matter what gear they have, okay? So that's actually the first thing, fitness. And in about a month, I'm doing another seminar on training and performance for climbing and outdoor sports consulting with some actual trainers, unlike me, I'm not a trainer, I'm not a physical trainer, so I don't know, but 
Um, and that's, that's where that comes in. But assuming that you're fit and you're working on a fitness program and training for the outdoors, then the next thing you can do to help yourself go, go fast is to carry less. So if you have this action suit arsenal put together that's functional, lightweight, warm, it keeps you dry, key thing, dry is more important than warm, then that'll help you go a long distance with the minimal amount of equipment. So it needs to be layered, thin layers. They need to be very fluid layers, like sleeves that can roll up and hoods that can put down and don and off, okay? And breathability is much more important than waterproofness. Trumps it many more times, more important. Next most important will be windproofness. And last important will be waterproof. So that's a good thing because a lot of the cheaper garments actually do do that for you. They're breathable. The king of breathability right now that crosses all spectrums is soft shell. So what happened to that jacket I had? That purple one? Okay. So this is this is the fabric that you want to keep an eye on. This one is crossing categories into the waterproof, breathable stuff. And they do they do seam tape soft shell, but why we love it, it's fairly light, it's stretchy. So there's less fabric used. It can, you have a tighter, more athletic fit. It breathes amazingly better than Gore-Tex, any breathable fabric that manufacturers will tell you about. And it's somewhat windproof, or it can be completely windproof if you have a barrier in it. And it can be completely waterproof, but at its worst, it's still water resistant. So how can you go wrong? It's water resistant. It's cheaper than Gore-Tex. It breathes better. It Keeps you out of the wind. I mean, it's a it's a miracle fabric. So soft shell has taken over everything in my kit except for my storm except for my storm jacket. And when I started climbing back in the 90s, fleece was the thing. Polar Tech fleece. I had fleece socks, fleece vests, fleece jacket, fleece everything. And now I have nothing that is fleece. It's all been replaced by soft shell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that that's that's my little thing on that. Um, the other things that you want to know about are nylon is the kind of the base fabric for all of it. It's synthetic, so it's cheap, um, and it breathes okay. That yields us polyester and polypropylene, but merino wool is a better substitute for anything built out of polypro or polyester, especially socks, base layers. If you can afford wool, that's what you want. Smart wool and icebreaker are probably the two top brands right now. <coughs> And then fleece, the one virtue that fleece still has is everybody has gotten rid of it and you can buy it for pennies on the dollar at thrift stores. Um, and North Face still makes great fleece jackets like they always have. And it's still a good fabric. It's just, it's just bulky. It doesn't compress at all. But it's, it's really cheap and it wears like iron. So fleece will last forever. So how about those layers? Um, in terms of what you want to do out there, now... I take this with a grain of salt because I have been out, I climb with a lot of ladies and sometimes I'm curious about what their experience is like in climbing. And one of our ELs, Terry, she often has a lot of layers on. One day I counted the layers she had on, she had nine layers on. And we were out there. <laughs> so I love you, Terry. <laughs> well, there's like, let's talk about all the layers that you could possibly have. You could have a short, short sleeve base layer, a long sleeve base layer, and then you could have a heavier weight base layer on top of that. Then you could have a soft shell with a vest on top of that, with a down jacket on top of that, with a Gore-Tex jacket over the top of that. Okay, so that must be at least seven right there. I don't know where the other layers came from. So, <laughs> And a belay jacket on top of that. So you can mix and match them. But this is a good system, okay? It's not. It's a good thing to have nine layers um, because then you can, you can fine-tune your system. It's way better than having one fat, huge layer that you're just sweating in and then you take it off and you're way too exposed to the elements. So what we're looking for is at least two layers in your lower body, that'd be a base and a mid. Your upper body, at least three, which would be base, mid, shell, or base, mid, more waterproof. Outer shell, like a soft shell. And then hand wear, obviously two sets, so a liner glove and an outer glove or mitt. Headwear, two types would be the balaclava and the toque, watch cap. And then socks, either two sets or uh, a liner, two, two liners, and, and a wool outer. That's kind of where you start with your clothing. I don't have underwear listed specifically on there, and that's not a big, 
item that takes a lot of weight penalty, but underwear and socks, things that you wear close to your body, you can wash them and dry them out, so you really don't ever need more than two, in my estimation. That's my opinion. No matter how long you're out, okay? You wear one, and you dry out the other one. So. And you don't need to replace any of the others at any point, to the detriment of your tent mates. You only need one base layer. You don't need multiple shirts, okay, to smell nice. Forget about that stuff. Let's go on to the next one. <laughs> okay, so mountaineering boots. Let's go through some important things. 8.30, okay. So this is also a fantastic hiking boot. People have liked this boot on the PCT. This, this is an example of a three-season lightweight mountaineering boot. This happens to be the Trango model of La Sportiva. Pretty much, my opinion, probably well-supported, I hope, La Sportiva rules the boot market in terms of mountaineering boots, climbing shoes, and possibly even running shoes. But we definitely stock them here in Bobcats, so you guys can get all of these. So this is the Trango. Why it's good is because it's waterproof, it's crampon compatible with a little clip on the back, and a place for a basket in the front. It's got the good old Vibram sole, plus it's sticky rubber, so it climbs rock. It's three-quarter length shank, so super stiff, so you can kick steps. The shank ends right here, so that while you're kicking steps, you can also hike in. Ooh, this one's not broken in at all, but you can hike in in this boot. Doesn't bend a whole lot, but it's comfortable enough for at least 10 miles, up to 15 miles or so. So that's what it does. It climbs rocks, snow and ice, keeps you warm. It's got a little bit of an insulating layer here, and you can use it for nine months out of the year here in the Sierra. This is the main boot you want, something like this. Um, don't forget about the super feet or sole removable footbeds. I think those are worth it. Um, if you buy a race car, you want to make sure that the seat you're sitting in is the best seat you can get. So this is the race car, so get a custom seat on the inside here for your feet, okay? And these are, are kind of out of uh, date and not really used except for in very high places above 20,000 feet. So double boots of any sort are really not needed. Single boots is about all that you're going to need. So let's go on to the next one. So socks, what I'm, what I'm doing with this part of the um, presentation is I'm giving you different brands that are, I think, that are good. And most of these we're going to have here at Gregor's at Bobcats Outdoors. So um, socks should be wool. That's it. <laughs> um, just pay the extra for them. They're so worth it. Um, liners, those should be probably nylon or silk or something really thin. Um, and then gaiters, we talked about those already. Um, there's a bunch of different types you can get, but um, you can often go without gaiters. They have pants that have cords built into them or cord holes, so you can take a little bit of string and put it around your cuff to hold it down. Then they also sell boots nowadays that have built-in gaiters. So they're, they're quite expensive, but they'd be just like this. And the gaiter is a super gaiter that goes all the way around the bottom and then zips up with a big zipper, and it, it goes up to at least mid-calf. And, and you own a pair. Yes. Baturas, right? Yeah. That's right. See? <laughs> I wish I owned a pair too. <laughs> I'll get there someday. So, in any case, if you need gaiters, you have some options. Again, the short, soft shell stuff is good too. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so back to base layers. Um, here's the main main brands that I talked about. Um, I said, you know, you're going to see REI on this list a lot. They're they're a good budget brand to buy and their stuff lasts really well as we all know you can return it right so that's a great thing for a year, you may have seen for a a year. Trek what's that you may have seen star star trek what these oh yeah <laughs> that's that's an older north face design yeah but again let, let's go to wool is what you want <laughs> yeah they did Woo. <laughs> what is that How's that, how's that go? Oh yeah, I like this. Thank you, Gregor. Okay. Um, so basically I, I kind of already went through this stuff. You know, we want, you want a zip neck, long sleeve, and if you have another base layer, then do a short sleeve underneath it. If you just have those two, you can mix and match them one on top of the other or leave them, wear them separately. And that's a pretty versatile system. Uh, yeah, I get it. Okay. I, th I think everything that's on there we've covered. So let's go on to the next one. Okay, so here's an example of fleece, and this is soft shell. Um, 
Yeah. Let's talk about DWR real quick. That's what is that all about? If you have a, a jacket that has nylon in it, and that'll probably be something that's referred to as a shell jacket like this. Um, a lot of the ability of the fabric to shed water is actually on a coating on the surface, durable water repellency or coating. And it's basically like little towers of wax, okay? And when, you're, when the water drops onto it, instead of getting the fabric wet, it protects the fabric from wetting out and it just beads up and rolls right off. It looks magical. When, when your jacket is brand new, it'll do this. And then some months or maybe a year later, you'll start to notice that it'll start hitting darker spots where the fabric will actually become, will get, will get wetted out. And when that's the case, the only protection you have against water is the actual micro thin layer of some sort of filament that's on the inside. That's where Gore-Tex and all the others make their money. Um, so you, you do need to have that layer in the middle and you need to keep your DWR on the outside. So you can reapply the DWR. You, there's a number of ways you can do that. You can spray it on, you can sponge it on, you can wash it on. Um, but what's interesting about this whole concept is it's not just nylon jackets that you can put DWR on. As a matter of fact, everything can have DWR. Fleece, soft shell, not wool, um, but any synthetic fabric you can put DWR on. So one thing that I've done is I do have my, my storm jacket that I take with me, but most of the time I like my soft shell, which I don't know where it went. Let me keep walking in front of the camera here. Was that it? Okay. So buy a soft shell like this. Buy the cheaper type that doesn't have the, the sealed, um, the sealed uh, sections where it's sewn. Seams, that's the word, sealed seams. And then just keep reapplying DWR on this fabric. It might not even have it to begin with, but that doesn't mean you can't put it on. So just coat it, okay? And then same thing with your gloves, okay? Does and your that, pants. What does that do to breathability? Uh, I don't know. I think it probably hampers it a little bit. But if you are if you have a soft shell jacket that you want to kind of use as an outer layer and it doesn't have seam, sealed, seam sealing on it, then I, I, I do it to all my clothing. All of it, all my soft shell stuff, all my nylon stuff, nothing base layer, but anything that would, would ever be an outer layer. So definitely soft shell pants, definitely soft shell jackets and nylon pants and nylon jackets and yeah. gloves. It's awesome on gloves that you're wearing the stuff. Yeah. Is it called DWR? It's, yeah, you'll, you'll see it listed that way. And so for example, Nick Wax, that's a, that's a brand that, that you can buy that you can apply DWR onto anything. So, so give it a shot. Has anyone else done this? Yeah. Okay, all right. so this is not just my idea. Okay, good. <laughs> all right. And gators. Okay, yeah, that's a good spot for them. Good. Is it washable after you put that on? Well, yes, but how, how it wears off is actually through abrasion. Oh. And just repeated use, just kind of flexes and comes off somehow. But it doesn't wash out because it's, it's basically a wax. Okay, it's a, it's a special type of coating that goes on the outside of your fabric. So I guess let's take 20 more seconds to talk about that. So think about this. So if you're washing it in, how do you know that the wax isn't on the inside of your jacket too? <laughs> so this is why I only use the spray on type on the outside. They do have this wash in version, but I think it probably coats the inside as well as the outside. I mean, how could it not? So. Don't wash the book. Some people have said that, you know, they say, don't wash your Gore-Tex stuff because it'll ruin it. You know, what they're doing is they're making outer fascia fabrics that when you wash them, these little towers of wax actually perk back up again for a while and it cleans them so that they breathe better. That's why I see some virtue in washing your clothing aside from the stink factor. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, wash them, but more importantly, put DWR on them. And depending on how often you're out, how to do your stuff, if you used it even a handful of times during the year, it'd be worth it to reapply. Reapply before every winter, basically. So, okay, let's go on. 840. Shell jackets. I guess, you know, I, I sounds like I'm trying to down shell jackets and stuff, but they are, when you need it, you need a storm jacket. This is the only thing that'll work. It's going to protect you against the wind and the storm and rain and snow. So, but they don't have to be heavy. So that, that's the takeaway is that they can be 12 ounces and be completely 
armor, uh, you know, they can be completely stormproof armor for you. So just make sure you get some good zips here because it's a bummer to have to take your rain pants on or off and have to take your boots on or off at the same time. So full zips on your pants are really worth it, whether or not you're dealing with crampons and harnesses. And then, yeah, so, and helmet compatible storm hood, that's probably one other thing to mention. Some manufacturers don't think about climbers wearing helmets, so um, they will design a tight fitting hood and it doesn't feel too good because it pushes the whole thing up and the zipper comes up at the top of your nose. So it doesn't work. So. <laughs> Let's go on to the next one. Okay, balaclava, this is the little toque I was talking about. Um, you can tell what portion of the country you're from depending on what you call this item. I'm from the Northwest. My dad called it a stocking cap. Is anybody from the East or from Canada? No? Okay, if you are, you'd probably call it a watch cap or a toque. It's the same thing, okay? It's a little warm, warm hat. Tassel is optional. Okay? <laughs> if you're really feeling Nordic, you can go with the tassel. Well, fast and light. <laughs> that's, that's right, fast and light. Oof, not coming with this on the trip. Um, so we I kind, of, we kind of already went through this, but here's the pictures at least for you guys, okay? So there's lots of good, there's lots of good stuff out there. Turtle fur is one that has so many designs, I like them. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So this is a little more snow climbing specific, but why do I have these in the slideshow? Because, well, it's kind of a safety item. Have you guys ever been out in really blinding snow and then felt like your eyes were really taking a beating? They really are. I mean, it's, it's burning them. So if you don't have protection, you can actually burn a portion of your eye that gives you, it's called snow blindness. And it's not permanent, but you actually will go partially blind. And you'll feel like you have sand inside of your eyes. They'll just burn and, and itch, I hear. Um, so use the appropriate sunglasses and you want to get a covering that goes all the way around because the snow can come in from all angles. Um, do you need goggles? That's the question. You know, I carried some around for years and then they just end up getting broken in my pack and taking up space, so I stop bringing them along. And only if I know I'm going out into a storm or I'm ice climbing, and then I'll bring goggles along. But even some of the glasses we have nowadays are really great for like low scale goggles. They'll function in all but the most nasty storms. So I don't know, you're a skier, Marusha, if you disagree with my assessment of goggles, but. <laughs> yeah, skiing, I mean, yeah. People are saying now that glazed glasses are at least protecting your eyes is just as important as sunscreen. Or yeah. Sunscreen. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Sunscreen. And it's protection for you for sure. So it's an important safety tool. I wouldn't be shy to spend some a lot of money on glacier glasses. It's really worth it. Your eyes are so valuable and you need to keep them. Okay. So go ahead and plunk down for those jewel bows. But the one thing about the ball as well, you would want lighter ones than what you have on. Those? Because you already have glacier glasses, so you can wear those in the sun. Oh, okay. Those on the sun in bad weather. Right. Or the fog. Well, sometimes you start hiking in the daytime. Right. So, Marisha is saying you, you could go with lighter weight goggles because you've already got glacier glasses. No, lighter. Right? Lighter color. Oh, lighter color. So, clear. Clear or, or fog. Fog. Okay. Yellow. Like a fog yellow, but not like you don't have to have like no, amber or. Or black. <laughs> okay, I'll change my picture for the next slide. <laughs> for the next time I do this one. Okay, let's go on. Okay, we, we did talk about this already, but here's an example of expedition mitts or over mitts. Okay. And here's an example of gauntlet length gloves. And I don't know why, maybe my little assessment is weird or something, but I don't know why they don't make more gloves with removable liners. So you can buy them. I consider them modular systems, just like the socks you know, that are the interface between your foot and your boot. I don't see why we can't have more than one set of socks for our hands, you know, and be able to take the liners in and out and trade them in and out depending on the warmth and the thickness and the, what we need them to do. So I think gloves is a great way to, to diversify your kit and really get exactly what you want. So be picky about it. And make sure that they work as an integrated system. And you don't have, so you don't have like, um, expedition mitt that goes from skin all the way to the outside, and then an expedition glove that goes from skin all the way to the outside. It'd be great if they nested inside each other. Okay, go on. Hey, here's where I talked about, I kind of already 
um, stole my own thunder on this in terms of the, the fabrics we're talking about. First thing I want to point out is this little item right here. This jacket and the idea of an outer jacket as a belay jacket, what like climbers would call it, is, is a nice concept. And it fits on the outside of your shell jacket. Why? Why does it fit on the outside of your shell jacket? Put it on and off real quick. Correct. Great. And so it needs to be sized accordingly. And it's basically like a sleeping bag with arms for your body. Okay. And in some cases, people do use it as a portion of their sleep system. There's something called an elephant's foot, which is the lower half of that idea. It's just a sleeping bag that comes to here. Okay. So you can wear your belay jacket as your sleeping bag and then bring up, you know, bring a little. Now I'll tell you a little story. I have some young kids and when I was, I've been experimenting with this stuff for a lot of years and I started experimenting with bivouacking. I had um, probably at that point, probably a four and two year old. So I had a child's synthetic sleeping bag and it was only this big. So I would bring my kid's <laughs> child's sleeping bag. It's a mummy, right? I zip the mummy all the way up and it'd be this tall. It's perfect. I bring my belay jacket, a children's sleeping bag. I got it. So <laughs> there's lots of things you can do to meet your solution. So here's the here's the different types. They all make puffies nowadays, but there's 800 fill, which is the most expensive. Then they go down to 700, and then 600, and that's basically the quality of the of the down, which is usually goose down, and the loft. More importantly, the number refers to the loft that it has. That's the ratio of space to air. Okay, so 800 is going to fill up more space, and 600 fills up almost as much. So, and there's quite a price difference. So. Just get the type that you need. Um, Mountain Hardware will sell you the 8,000 meter parka. That's what they call it. That's for peaks that are over 26,000 feet. You don't need that one for <laughs> Whitney, for example. Um, this little lightweight thing we had here is the other end of that spectrum. This is great for, for what it can be used for. Um, and we want to make sure that it's, it's durable enough to last. Oh, that was the outside. Um, but you just have to know the limitations of your gear. Okay, you don't want to go tromping through the forest with this jacket because it might get ripped. Um, and then you probably don't want to take it on, on Denali because even though it's a puffy, it's not the right choice. But in certain environments, this is a great choice. You know, snow <laughs> only, spring skiing, you know, things where it doesn't get too cold. So I guess the point is if you can assort your gear accordingly. Try to get something that's as versatile as possible. And if you need more warmth, instead of getting a different type of jacket or pants, just start layering. So if you've got lots of lots of thin things, then just put all those thin things together. So that's, that's probably the best way to go about it. Then you've always got the right gear. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So backpacks, let's go back to when I took, spoke about earlier. So a 30 liter pack. Um, so this is a climbing pack. Um, and we know that because, well, Black Diamond told us so, for one thing, right? <laughs> but also because it doesn't have many bells and whistles. This is a poor excuse for a waistband and also straps, but this is a fast and light pack and it shouldn't carry more than 30 pounds anyway. So the frame is not very substantial. Um, it only has just what you need, places for your eye sacks. Um, these clips on the side can hold any vertical item like pickets, ropes, tent poles, rolled up jackets, sleeping mats, anything like that. And then some of the important features that you want to look for in a pack that's this small is the expandable collar. You guys, if you've done any backpacking, you know this is, this is a lifesaver sometimes when you have to haul in a lot of stuff, okay? So you can cram stuff in here, I mean, forcefully, and and shake it on the ground, and I've even put my foot in my pack before and gone, and use stuff sacks to zip everything down as small as it can be. And then you put the expansion collar up, and you zip that up, and you can roll stuff up and put it underneath the top lid. And if they're thinking, they'll give you a really, large expandable top lid so you can fit stuff underneath the top lid okay and then you could strap stuff rolled up in big bundles on the side of the pack so 
Now you're thinking to my, yourself, Darren, you didn't fit at all in a 30 liter. You're carrying like 50 liters worth of gear, but it's on a 30 liter pack. Well, that may be, but there's still some limit. So, but the point is that you can fit it in a 30 liter. And if you have to expand a little bit more, you've got some capacity. And then when you get to camp, okay, you can take off the top lid. You can take out the frame sheet. You can take off the waist belt. And now you have a 30 liter day pack that weighs one pound or less. I don't know which, how much it weighs, it's super light. So this is a, an example of a, of a lightweight pack that could be really versatile for you. Anybody else had suggestions or comments on packs? Something that's worked for you? This, I know this is a big topic for backpackers. What's your, what's your thoughts on how to go lightweight with packs? Got any tips? No? Nope. Off for ourselves. Um, packs that have the, the top of the seat detachable and you wear it like a big thing. Okay, like yeah. So your top lid could be your Summit Assault Pack. Okay, I have one of those. Yeah, that's good. Okay, you, you can, packs is a whole rabbit, there's a, a rabbit hole of confusing things that, that you could get into here. Um, but I think one thing that might be useful is just to go through the brands real quick because Osprey was mentioned, they're, they're one of the kings but they're not necessarily the lightest weight. Um, mountain Hardware is a really durable brand, but they're definitely mountain specific. Black Diamond is built by climbers. They'll be very streamlined and very Spartan. Arcteryx is more of a luxury, fast and light, very expensive pack, but they make them that are completely waterproof and their design is impeccable. Gregory is actually built right here in Sacramento, as far as I know. Isn't this where their headquarters are? Gregory. That's what I heard. I they <laughs> Did they? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, Darn it. Like everyone else. <laughs> they, got, they got bought out by a, I forget. Did they? Oh, no. wow. Okay. okay. Well, for whatever reason, um, they still make great packs, and we have a lot of them on the wall here. And then one that I added recently is kind of a new up and comer called Chilo Gear. They've, they've gotten the best ratings out there because their packs are completely customizable. And they're a kind of a boutique pack company out of Portland, and they're definitely worth looking into. If you if you want to look into lightweight gear, you'll be really impressed with their stuff. You won't be impressed with their price, but they are awesome, and everybody says so. So Chilo Gear, take note of that one. Let's go on to the next one. We're going to have to wrap up real quick here. We did talk about sleeping pads and bags already. Um, you don't have to have an inflatable mattress. You know, the closed cell foam will work great and they won't deflate on you in the middle of the night. Um, a bivouac sack is something that should be mentioned in place of a tent. I'll get to hopefully shelter here in a second. But, you know, they make such great bivvies nowadays that um, they can be a one person all, you know, all weather shelter. And this one is actually one of the heavier ones because it has the luxury uh, hoop over your head. Okay, so it can actually stay off your face. It's about this big. Um, but a bivy sack is an appropriate shelter to carry with you if you're going fast and light. You can use it in the snow. What about condensation? There is some issue with that, just like all tents. So you just do a little venting and be careful. All right, let's go on to the next one. Tents, we already kind of talked about it, but I guess the take home from this one is. Um, single wall is the way to go, okay, in all aspects, even in mountaineering. If you can afford it, a single wall is the way to, is the way to go. Just make sure you put all your guy lines on because that significantly increases the strength of your tent. It could even be freestanding. Guy lines are key. Let's go to the next one. You can go with tarps. You could go with floorless tents like the Mega Mid, okay. Um, all of those are options. They don't stand up too well when the storms come unless they're really guide out very strategically. Um, and if you're going to be in any sort of weather that's going to be blown in like snow, something like this isn't going to work too well above timberline. So once again, you have to just decide, are you going to be above timberline? Is there a chance of snow? Is there even a chance of rain? So maybe you don't even need a shelter. Maybe you should just sleep out in your sleeping bag. I mean, 90% of the time, it seems like you could be okay that way in the Sierra. If it's not gonna rain that night, and you have a durable, you know, a good sleeping bag, probably not the 55 I told you about. But if you have something like that, you could, you could make it, you know, through most of the seasons in the Sierra with no tent whatsoever. 
And what would you, what could you do if uh, if you do have weather? Well, I bring an eight by ten aluminum space blanket, and that can be your tarp. It can also be your rain jacket. It can be your tarp. It can be your your shelter. Whatever, however, you, however you want to rig it. Okay, that's a that's a great piece of gear to have. Let's skip this one where you talked about stoves. All right, other equipment. You can bring a um, a bladder like this one instead of hard shell water bottles. So when the when the water's gone out of it, it folds up. Um, I think none of these are gonna be really exciting. We already discussed many of these already. So let's go on to the next one. Okay, so here's here's our interpretation of 10 essentials for lightweight, folks. So first off, they kind of start out in as, as a list of everything that you should always have with you when you're going outside, right? And then they kind of were kind of turned into systems. And so what I've tried to do is give you the minimum that you should have if you're going to obey this rule, okay? So you can see here, map and compass, a balaclava counts as extra insulation, like I already said. One energy bar that's left over, so you, you make sure you don't eat that, that's your extra nutrition. Um, a small LED illumination, a mini lighter, sharp belay knife, um, glacier glasses, a stereo pen, cell phone, These all these items don't take up much space. And often we can combine these with the group so that not everybody has to have each one of these items. There's only a few things that I always, always bring. One of them is a map. Another one is a knife. Another one is a headlamp. Another one is a balaclava. That's about it. <laughs> the group has it. Sometimes I'm carrying it, but I don't have it personally. All right, let's go on to the next one. We're going to um, skip through this stuff. Uh, skip this one. Yeah, let's skip this one. Uh-huh. <laughs> I have many other presentations so I can go through this again some other time. And you guys might not care. So let's go on to the next one. Oh, here's where we need to end up. All right, got a few minutes. So good old freeze-dried foods. How many of you have eaten them before? Show of hands. How many of you have hated them? About half of you. How many of you have loved them? Okay, good. Sometimes it depends on the brand, right? Or yes. whether you had that last night. <laughs> right okay so i'd say on the whole they've gotten better over the years they're tastier and there's more options than ever and the same thing with the trail bars if you, this is just a great way to go but don't bring more than one of any particular meal for a trip and try to, try to change it up one nice thing about them after you're done they create a great um stuff sack for garbage um there's some other things you can do at the store you know that are kind of they they tout them as like microwavable or you know dehydrated and that kind of stuff places like winco i know is a store that's near me they have a whole dehydrated bulk food section you could spend a lot of time going through there and it, when i went through my um program for training in this i have a degree in outdoor rec we actually spent a lot of time teasing out the Knowles outward bound model of how many pounds per person per day depending on how many days you're out and what activity you're doing and how you feed a whole troop on you know, dehydrated black beans and tortillas and peanut butter and all that stuff. So I, I do come from a backpacking background. But over the years, what's happened is my kit has gotten more and more simple. So it boils down to, again, only what I can do with hot water. That's the hot meal at night. And everything else is dry. And, and if possible, I want to go out when it's cold. So I have the luxury of bringing chocolate and cheese. Those are my big things that I like to Cheese. Cheddar, sure. <laughs> pepper jack, nothing yeah. special, just because it's we, cold. Yeah, you know? we took some harder cheese on one trip. It was in the middle of summer. Though, yeah, so we chose it because it would it would spoil. Yeah, whereas yeah. cheddar is a little bit softer. So yeah. Yeah. And so you, know, you can bring those things along, but if it's most of the time in, out here, it's just too darn hot for that kind of stuff. So. You're going to be um, stuck with with gels, which are great. Again, bring lots of flavors, and yes, they're a little bit expensive. You can make your own, by the way. There's ways to make this stuff at home for far cheaper. And then another thing that I really like, but again, is going to cost you a little money, is mix in carbohydrates. So they're basically like a 
a power bar or, or a goo or a gel, but it's in powder form, okay? And, you know, endurance athletes use this stuff all the time. So it's liquid carbs, really. So you can be hydrated and get energy at the same time. And that's the ultimate lightweight. Just consider if all of your stuff was dehydrated or carbohydrate gel or, or um, powdered carbs. You could go a long way on super minimalistic food. So. Do you advocate for making your own trail bar? I'm not that creative, but you can. That's how Cliff got started, right? Cliff Bar. <laughs> There's lots of great options in the store now for those. I don't. I know REI, for example, sells a lot of this food, but I find that just plain old grocery store is the only place I need to go for what I what I use. One of my favorite tricks is to buy the the family size package of mashed potatoes from Idahoan, and they have it. It costs 98 cents. They have 400 to 600 calories, depending on which one you buy, um, and they have about eight or nine different flavors. And and they taste okay, and you can mix you can mix anything in the thing, cheese, Fritos, salt, meat, bacon, sausage, whatever you just throw it all in there. Or last night's dinner, you know, throw it in there. It's it's great, and it's powdered, so you can make as much or as little as you want. And if you have some left over, bring it for the next night. And often I'll I'll have a couple dehydrated meals, but I'll leave one or two days short, and the rest of it I'll bring one packet of mashed potatoes and maybe an extra bar for that last day. And usually what happens is I'll eat everything I have in the last 12 hours. I'll just be coming out on crumbs. You know, I'll have my last bar about a mile before the trailhead. And it's good. So it's cheap and it's a good way to go. All right. I think it's time to close up. I'm just going to give you a couple places to go for resources. So, um, I'll keep it on this one because I know you probably write this stuff down. And there's one more slide that just says thank you. But that's it for tonight. And thanks for listening and your input. Appreciate it. So. You wouldn't have this, uh, this presentation. Anymore.